What you can see here are all the legendary weapons available in the entirety of Tears of the Kingdom. From ancient time travel, pirate voyages across vast oceans, dark secrets of long lost worlds, bit adventures to the origin of Hyrule where everything in the The Legend of Zelda universe began. These weapons are truly one of a kind. Acquiring these weapons is darn easy, can be done super quickly and the rewards are simply phenomenal. If you love Tears of the Kingdom then you absolutely must have these weapons because every collector out there is itching to call them their own. I wish I would have had these much earlier. The very first legendary weapon with a really cool backstory is the White Sword of the Sky. To obtain this sword we need to complete the short quest line. First head to any of the springs in the world, either the Spring of Courage here in Farren, the Spring of Wisdom at the peak of Leneru in the east of the map in the snowy area or to the Spring of Power Nakala in the northeast of the map. The respective statue at your chosen spring will tell you that it can no longer sense the presence of the Great Hylia statue and instructs you to check on it. So now we go to the Forgotten temple at the upper left corner of the map in the gorge where the mansion statue is located. Once you enter the temple and proceed to its end you'll find a giant overturned statue of Hylia. Now press A to speak with it and it will tell you what happened. Oh man, I tripped and bumped my knee, what a pity. Since we couldn't care less about her problems and just want the goddamn sword, let's return to our spring where we came from. Speak with your statue and it will tell you that you need to obtain a claw from the dragon associated with your spring. If you're at the spring of courage, you'll need a claw from Feroche. At the spring of power, a claw from Eldra and at the spring of wisdom, a claw from Nydra. Simply fly to your respective dragon, shoot the claw with an arrow, collect it and return to the spring. I know it sounds quite tiring, I thought the same at first, but you can easily do everything in 5 minutes. Now place the claw in front of the statue and you'll be rewarded with gemstones. Ah, but don't forget to speak with the statue again before you place the claw on the ground, otherwise it won't work. Great, now do this for each spring, so bring the corresponding claw to each spring and the statue at your last spring will thank you and inform you that the great Hylia statue has been repaired. If you go to her now you'll see that she's not only repaired but also standing upright. With the words finally standing again thanks brother she will then give you the white sword of the sky. Jokes aside she thanks you for your courage strength and wisdom which is a reference to the springs and the history of the Triforce. The white sword of the sky is essentially the goddess sword from Skyward Sword which has now received a new name. It has a strength of 24 damage, durability of 45, no special abilities but an extremely cool backstory. For combat this sword is decent but not the best option. It's better to store it in a weapon mount at Link's home so you can always admire it. If your sword breaks just bring one claw from each ring to the big statue and she will give you a new sword. The next legendary weapon is the big Goron sword and let me tell you this thing is incredibly awesome and much easier to obtain than the last one. To get it simply head to Akala at the upper right corner of the map and then north to the Skull Lake. Now jump into the left eye as that's a hole. Once you're down there you'll only find a few bone enemies waiting for you. They're not really tough plus a star knocks and a chest that can only be opened once you defeat all enemies. So as you're falling down it's best to use bullet time to eliminate all the enemies and then take on the big star knocks alone. After that you'll find the big Goron sword and the chest. A legendary great sword forged by a Goron craftsman for a hero who traveled through time. The exceptionally sharp cutting edge is a testament to the craftsman's mastery. This is a reference to the Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time which is not only considered by many to be the best Zelda game but also one of the greatest video games of all time. Fun fact Ocarina of Time was also my very first Zelda game that I played when I was 4 to 5 years old. Well I mostly watched my dad play it but it was still awesome. The sword deals 38 damage, I know it's displayed as 36 but that's apparently not accurate and it has a durability of 60, making it the second most durable weapon in the game. But that's actually nothing compared to Breath of the Wild where it had a durability of 144 and was literally unbreakable. In summary the big Goron sword is a fantastic two handed weapon designed for combat so make use of it. I mean it was made by Gorons and they don't really use it as a spoon. The next weapon is absolutely incredible and iconic like hardly any other weapon. It's none other than the sword of the hero. To obtain the sword of the hero which is incredibly easy and can be done by anyone at any time head to the shrine under Satori mountain and then to the corresponding tree root right under the shrine. Once you arrive there look to the south east. There are many trees on the map and a treeless circle. That's our destination. At this spot you'll find a tree stump with an angry tree and a chest inside it. Either defeat the tree now or simply ignore it. In either case open the chest and you'll find the sword of the hero. A sword once wielded by a hero in an ancient age. When it's grasped the strange sense of nostalgia washes over you. Take it when going alone would otherwise be dangerous. And now it gets really cool because this is a reference to the very first Zelda game where Link received this exact sword 
Like this exact sword from an old man who said, it's dangerous to go alone. Take this. The sword itself does 17 damage, has a durability of 27 and has no special abilities. So you can use it for combat, especially at the beginning of the game considering how easily you can obtain it, but later in the game I wouldn't really recommend it. So I think it's best to display this collector's item on a weapon mount. The next weapon is, for many, by far the strongest of all legendary weapons in the game, even stronger than the master sword. And it's the fierce deity sword. And I can't blame people for that, with that helical blade that thing looks so awesome, just add the matching armor and <laughs> wow dude. But before we can get our hands on the sword, we first need to grab the fierce deity armor set. To start things off, head west from central Hyrule to this big tree and jump down. Once you're down, turn around and go where the lianas block a passage. Cut these lianas with the sword. Now you will see a big fat root which you need to climb all the way to the top. Once you're up there, cut the lianas again and open the chest behind. This is the fierce deity pants and the first of three parts. The next part can be obtained at the Skull Lake again, but this time in the right eye, not the left one, on the upper right part of the map in Akala. To reach this spot, it's best to create a flying device. Jump into the eye, follow the path, ignore the enemies and climb up to the rocky ledge in the middle of the cave. In this chest, you'll find the fierce deity hat, the second of three parts. For the final piece, we'll stay in Akala, but this time go to the Akala Citadel, which you can find here. There, you'll discover a hole in the wall. Crouch, jump down and voila, the last chest containing the fierce deity chest plate. Now we have the complete armor set and we're ready to go. To finally get the sword, head to Sefla Lake on the upper right and enter the cave next to it. In front of the cave, you'll find two guys you need to talk to. Now put on the entire armor set from earlier on. But be careful, and this is really important, you need to put on the entire armor set because otherwise it won't work and enter the cave. Because we're wearing the complete armor set, a mysterious wall will now open, revealing a chest containing, who would have guessed it, the fierce deity sword. A peculiar great sword allegedly used by a hero from a world in which the moon threatened to fall. It slashes wildly in battle as if possessed by a fierce deity. This is a reference to The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask, a very dark game where the world is threatened by a moon about to crash into the earth and we as Link have to prevent it. In that game, the sword transformed Link, making him extremely powerful but also caused him to lose control over himself. Fortunately though, in Zelda Tears of the Kingdom we don't have that side effect, we only get the benefits of this monstrous blade. The sword is a two-handed weapon with 38 damage, durability of 35, no special abilities but it looks incredibly cool. With the right fuse, this thing becomes brutally powerful and should definitely be used in combat by almost all players. Ah, uh, and by the way, I'll show you at the end of the video how to repair and buy new weapons, so you should definitely check that out. The next weapon isn't actually a sword, but a bow, and it's really epic. I'm talking about the Shadow Bow. The Shadow Bow is probably the easiest weapon to get in this entire video. All you have to do is go to the top of Hyrule Castle to a tower. In that tower, a piece is missing, and right inside that gap lies the Shadow Bow which will respawn after every blood moon, so roughly every 2 hours and 48 minutes. So, if you want to, theoretically speaking, you can fill your entire inventory with only shadow bows. If you don't want to have to annoyingly fly up here every time, I strongly recommend placing one of your teleportation medallions here. Theoretically, you could also climb up here, but that takes forever. A bow that's been in the royal family for ages, said to have been used by a princess who fought beasts of twilight. It forcefully fires long-range arrows, which is also the specialty of this bow. And one reason why I like this bow so much is that it originates from Twilight Princess. In that game, Zelda fought alongside Link using this bow against Ganondorf. Honestly, I'm not sure why, as I haven't seen much of Twilight Princess, but that story always somehow breaks my heart. At least, I don't really feel good when I think about it. In this game, however, Zelda looks absolutely stunning. She has quite a different look. The Shadow Bow has a durability of 40, making it the third most durable long-range bow. It deals 30 damage and has a range of 40, tying with the falcon bow for the longest range. For comparison, most bows in Tears of the Kingdom have a range of 20. This translates into the Shadow's bow's arrows flying much further and straighter, so more in a straight line if you know what I mean. But that's actually nothing compared to Breath of the Wild, where its arrows, like those of the Bow of Light, flew like a beam of light infinitely far in a perfectly straight line. This bow is very useful for shooting down Korok balloons, activating pressure plates and shrines, catching materials like honey and lizards, and so on. While it can certainly be used in combat, there are still better options. Whether you leave it at home or take it into battle with you is up to you. The next weapon is one of, well, how do I put it, a unique type? Or maybe not unique, but it's somehow everything. 
It's strong, looks fancy, it's rare and has an interesting story. I'm talking about the Dusk Claymore, which is almost a bit too thin to be a weapon, but don't let its appearance fool you. To obtain it, go to the Typhlo Ruins in the middle top part of the map near the tower, glide there and then talk to the guy by the tent. This way, you will activate the required quest. Now simply examine each of the four stones in front of him and it will start four different side quests. I know, I know, it sounds totally annoying to have to do all this stuff and kind of actionless and well, that's exactly what it is. I want to be honest with you. But once you know what to do, it's quickly done and that's why I am here. First, go to this part in the west where you see these three stone straps on the map and activate Unibo's ability. And now roll in between the dragon heads. That's it! Now a chest appears which we open and we're already done with one of the four side quests. Head to the upper left part of Typhlo Ruins where there's water on the map and dragon heads around you. Activate Sidon's ability by charging the sword at the center and voila, everything gets wet. Collect the chest, two out of four done. Now right where you met the guy on the map, stand on a platform Platform, activate Tulin's ability and blow on the statue and voila, take the chest. 3 out of 4 done. Now the final side quest and then we'll have the Dusk Claymore. Go east from Typhlo Ruins, here at this spot close to the edge of the island. There you'll find a platform, activate Reju's ability and when the lighting zone is over it, shoot an arrow at the platform. A thunder strikes, a chest appears and we're done. If you now have everything, go to the right of the tower, there's a cave entrance which you can see here on the map and we're going down there. At the bottom you'll find a final text and the chest with the claymore. A slender claymore thought to have been handed down to the kingdom of Hyrule ages ago. The blade shines with a holy luster. This is also a reference to Twilight Princess where something very special was done with the sword which went terribly wrong but I won't spoil it. Anyway, as far as I know this sword comes from an alternate world which is why it says it arrived in Hyrule a long time ago. And to be honest this sword used to be called the Sword of Six Ages and not Dust Claymore but well yeah, who cares right? Basically we don't need to care about that because with its 32 damage and 50 durability it's not only incredibly strong but also the third most most durable sword in all of Tears of the Kingdom. It looks cool, it's great for combat, not many people own it, so it's an absolute 10 out of 10. As you've probably noticed, you need all four heroes abilities, so you need to be further along on the story. The weapon that's coming now will surprise many of you. Why? Well, because in all six years of Tears of the Kingdom and BOTW, I've never seen anyone play with its type boomerangs. To be precise, it's about the sea breeze boomerang, which with its cheerful yellow coloring and simple design always brings good vibes. To get it, go to Hebra Peak in the upper left part of the map and then to the shrine to the left of it. There's a route right beneath it and that's where we need to go. From there, head east to the peak of Hebra Mountain, which is a deep chasm in the depths. Generally speaking, remember that the depths is always the opposite of the overworld. So a mountain on the overworld is a chasm in the underworld and vice versa. Once you arrive here, you will immediately find a chest and in the chest you'll find the sea breeze boomerang. No enemies, no puzzles, nothing. A boomerang said to have been used by a hero who traveled the great sea. It smells faintly of salt water. This is a reference to the Legend of Zelda The Wind Waker where we play as Link and explore the ocean with ships and pirates because the world was mostly just a vast sea with islands. Oh my goodness, talking about this gives me such goosebumps. I, I do, I love Zelda. The sea breeze boomerang deals 16 damage, has 20 durability and its special feature, obviously because it's a boomerang is they can be thrown and then returns to you. So it's more of a medium distance weapon so please don't compare its stats to melee weapons. In fact it's actually the best one handed boomerang in the entire game. Of course some might say don't play it, uh, it's bad, but I say go ahead if you like. Fighting with a boomerang is super fun and it's strong enough to dominate quite a few monsters. Next up is another shield, namely the sea breeze shield, which with its silver decorations and triforce looks more elegant than practical compared to the Hylian shield, at least at first glance. We find the sea breeze shield, again in a tree stump in the depths. To be precise, you can find it in the corner of the Zora region near the Zora river on the eastern part of the map, just in the depths. Go there to this large tree stump, avoid the aggressive tree and open the chest. Here we have the sea breeze shield. A shield said to have been the favorite of a hero who traveled the open seas. It was apparently a family heirloom passed down through many generations. And this makes me really nostalgic, even though it's only been about two years since I've played Wind Waker, where you get the shield right at the beginning along with the green clothes from your grandma on your home island. The game has such a wonderful aura, Link finally has his own personality and doesn't just stand around. It was amazing. I still love you grandma. The sea breeze shield is actually really good and I mean that exactly as I say it. It has 65 shield strength, 90 durability, no special properties but well you can fuse whatever you want onto it anyways. That makes it the second most durable shield in the entire game right after the Hylian shield. So if you're not using the shield in combat, I 
I really have no idea how to help you. All right, we just talked about the Hylian shield, so what's up next? And good news, every player can get it super easily at any time right now. Does that sound too good to be true? Look, at Hyrule Castle, there's a gap in the outline of the castle on the map in the upper left corner. That's the harbor entrance of the castle into the castle. Actually, you're intended to go in there with a boat. But flying with a glider from the top of the castle and then gliding in with a paraglider is definitely better. Keep yourself to the left and go upstairs. When you encounter the gloom hands, which are annoying, either defeat them or jump down to the right. Wait until they disappear and then climb up the stairs again. Alternatively, just climb up to the right on the large stone shield on the wall. At the top, you'll find many torches and a fire in the center. Light your arrow and ignite the fire. Now a chest appears with the Hylian shield. A shield passed down through the Hyrulean royal family along with the legend of the hero who wielded it. Its defensive capabilities and durability outshine all other shields. The Hylian shield, just like the Master Sword, comes from Skyward Sword, where everything in the Legend of Zelda began, and both have appeared in Zelda games continuously since then. The design of them doesn't come from nowhere. Each element has a fixed emotional significance, which I think is fantastic, but explaining that would take too long. For me, personally, these these two items have always symbolized the Legend of Zelda, not Link, Ganondorf, nor even Zelda herself. And that's why these two are my favorite weapons from all video games on Earth. I don't know if this sounds familiar to you, because I've never really mentioned it in public, but yes, there's a reason behind the logo. The Hylian Shield has 90 shield strength, 800 durability, no abilities, making it not only the strongest shield in the game by far, but also simply just overpowered. Use it in combat, that's why it was born, there's nothing to add to it. The next weapon is the Boulder Breaker, a gigantic, blunt weapon that hits you so hard that you have to pick up your bones in the neighboring country. The Boulder Breaker actually can't be found, nor will it be gifted to you. You have to have have it crafted by a blacksmith in Garonia. For that, you'll need a cobble crusher, five flint, and three diamonds. You can find the cobble crusher to the west of Death Mountain, marked by a small wooden structure on the map. Go there, ignore the enemies, and pick it up from where it lies against the wall. Funny thing, it reappears here after every blood moon. I have no idea who puts it here. The diamonds and flints can be found in ores all over the world, or obtained by defeating stone taluses. There's no trick to it. You can look in all the caves in the Goron area, in the southern mine, small gorges, etc. Then talk to the blacksmith again and voila, you have the boulder breaker. However, here's the thing, you can only have one boulder breaker at a time and the blacksmith will only craft a new one once the current one is broken. This two-handed weapon was once wielded by the Goron champion the Rook. The Rook made swinging it around look easy, but a Hylian would need an immense amount of strength. The Rook is the former Goron champion and thus originates from BOTW. He was a friend of Link who protected all those in need. Oh, and let me tell you a secret. He always called Link brother and, here comes the thing, was afraid of dogs. The Boulder Breaker deals 38 damage, has 40 durability and the special ability that it deals 50% more damage against all based enemies like Talises and Frogs. So 57 damage per hit without fusion. This makes it perfect for combat, especially when a strong item is fused to it. Two-handed weapons have generally become much better and it has incredibly high durability. So super super strong. Next up is the Light Scale Trident, a beautiful, festive looking looking spear adorned with precious gemstones. You also need to have this spear crafted by a blacksmith named Dento. He can be found in the Zora village near the arrow shop. To obtain it, you'll need a Zora spear, five flintstones and three diamonds. The Zora spear can be taken from a bokoblin at the start of the bridge near the bone pond at this location on the map, or from a Lizalfos at the hideout near the path to the Zoras precisely in this forested area. Again, for flint and diamonds, farm ores or defeat stone taluses. Now return to Dento and have the light skill tried in Crafted. Remember, just like before, you can only have one at a time, and you can only craft a new one once the old one is broken. A spear of peerless grace cherished by the Zora champion Mifa. Although Mifa specialized in healing abilities, her spearmanship was in a class all its own. Mifa was a young Zora during the events of BOTW, who was in love with Link and tragically died in battle. She has a beautiful theme music and an angelic character, which is why everyone in the Zelda community loves her. She's even more popular than Zelda herself, no joke, everyone adores her that much. Her weapon deals 22 damage and has a durability of 70, making it the most durable weapon in all of Tears of the Kingdom. As lovely as she is, I wouldn't have tolerated any other decision Nintendo. Moreover, and here comes the special part, it has the ability that when wet, it deals double damage. So break a choo-choo jelly or activate Sidon's ability, temporarily allowing us to perform water-based attacks. Now add an additional 50% attack boost through food or armor and then attach a strong material to it. And this thing becomes incredible. You can achieve well over 
over 100 damage per hit. Without a shadow of a doubt, it belongs among the strongest weapons in the game, so please use it, but heaven forbid you break it. Next up, and yes, you hear right, two weapons at once, the Scimitar of the Seven and the Daybreaker Shield. And if you were already convinced by Mifa's Spear, you absolutely must have these, because they are even stronger. For this, go to Gerudo and talk to the woman at the jewelry shop. She'll tell you that the owner has disappeared, which is a big problem because she's the smith who crafts our weapons. So we need to find her. She's located to the west of Gerudo town in the Toroma dunes. When you arrive there, you'll see her standing on a sandstone in the middle of the open desert, visibly frightened. The reason... Oh my god, the Molduga! Uh, to, 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 to defeat that thing? Uh, guidebook, guidebook, uh, uh, yes, shoot arrows into the ground and the Molduga will emerge. Use bomb plants to shoot and destroy it. Go, go, go. Oh, now talk to Isha, the owner and old friend of mine with whom I've fallen into the gem addiction and she'll tell you that she needs 4 diamonds, 10 flints, 1 Gerudo scimitar and a Gerudo shield to craft the scimitar of the 7 and the daybreaker shield. You might be wondering why this is more expensive than the previous weapons? Well, because this time we're getting 2 weapons, not just one. You can find the Gerudo shield at the Great Cliffs right here on the stone pillar and a new one appears after every blood moon. Also right here on the map, a Lazalfos drops a Gerudo scimitar at a monster camp and a also respawns after every blood moon. While there are other locations where you can find them on the ground or in chests, these are the easiest spots. And if you take a look, you'll see that both spots are right next to each other, so you can pick up both the scimitar and the shield together. Now head to Gerudo town and have her craft them. A famous sword once beloved by the Gerudo champion Obosa. It is said that when Obosa swung the sword in battle, her movements resembled a beautiful dance. This shield was cherished by the Gerudo champion Obosa. The gold used to make it was hand to ensure a design that is both lightweight and very durable. Urbosa is the former Gerudo champion, possessing incredibly powerful lighting abilities and an artistic fighting style. She was the leader of the Gerudo before Riju and something of a mother figure to Zelda as Zelda's biological mother passed away early on. And yes, you might already hear, the Gerudo are my favorite people in Tears of the Kingdom, at least I find them the most interesting. The Scimitar of the Seven deals 28 damage, has 60 durability, so it's nearly as strong as the Master Sword. But what makes this weapon so extremely overpowered is its ability to double the damage added by fusing materials, regardless of what you fuse. So it can exceed 100 attack power by far. Since it's a one-handed weapon, you can still carry a shield and be additionally protected, it strikes quickly, has high durability, everything. The Daybreak the Breaker Shield has a shield strength of 48, which is quite good, 60 durability, making it the third most durable shield in Zelda TOTK, and the ability to lose 50% less durability when shield surfing. And if you attach a frozen piece of meat to it, which makes you slippery and therefore slide faster, the shield is very likely to be the best shield for shield surfing in all of Tears of the Kingdom. Can I recommend this shield? Absolutely. For what? For everything. The next weapon is a bow again, namely the Great Eagle Bow, a blue and yellow bow with a very interesting appearance. To obtain it, go to Rito Village and talk to Teva. He'll tell you that he needs 5 bundles of wood, 3 diamonds and a swallow bow. You can find the swallow bow at the flight range with the large fluffy owl leaning next to the table. In case you're wondering, the flight range is located north of the village, west to the tower, so just teleport there and glide down. To get bundles of wood, you need to cut down trees with an axe or something similar and you can obtain diamonds from ores or by defeating stone taluses. Now talk to Teva and you'll receive the great eagle bow. A bow without equal equal wielded by the Rito champion Ravali. It is said Ravali could lose arrows with the speed of a gale, making him supreme in aerial combat. Now, Ravali isn't really a friend of Link, rather, he's a rival who always wanted to be the chosen hero himself, quite selfish and with a strong sense of self-confidence. The Great Eagle Bow deals 28 damage and fires 3 arrows at once, so 3 times 28 damage. It has 60 durability, a range of 40, which along with the Dusk Bow gives it the greatest range in the game. It's certainly good for combat, don't get me wrong, but but there are slightly better options too. Now there are two very important pieces of information, so listen up. First, you can purchase almost all legendary weapons for Pose at the Pose statue, provided you've owned the desired weapon in the game before. Here, it doesn't matter whether you got the weapons from an amiibo or through the methods shown earlier. Additionally, they cost only 100 to 150 posts each, which isn't much at all, so it's not a problem to fill your entire inventory with legendary weapons. Second, as you just saw, acquiring some weapons 
can be quite complex. So here's a way you can repair each of them an infinite amount of times whenever they run out of durability. When a grey Octorok, like the one here at this position on the map, absorbs and spits out your weapon, it'll be restored to full durability. However, and this is really important to note, this won't work with the legendary weapon alone. You must fuse the legendary weapon onto another weapon. Caution, the legendary weapon must be fused onto another weapon and not another weapon onto the legendary weapon. This is really important. After that, go to Terrytown and Akala and talk to this little Goron here, as you can separate both weapons without you losing either of them. And please don't attempt this in your own inventory, as doing so will cause you to lose the fused weapon or material, which we don't want. Now we've covered the entire Zelda story and you have all the legendary weapons, along with additional knowledge that only a few Zelda players know. Now only one legendary weapon remains, the legendary weapon, the Master Sword. If you don't have this iconic sword, then all the others we've collected today were completely pointless and in vain. To acquire the Master Sword, I've already made a video that explains all the methods to obtain it. Everything you need to know. Tips, tricks, I really don't want to brag, but the video is perfect. Get the Master Sword now, or you'll be playing Zelda without truly playing Zelda. That's all there is to it. It's immensely worth it. That said, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.